Good evening. Good evening. We welcome very, very much to Conversations, where I'm pleased to welcome to the program Louis O. Kelso. And Mr. Kelso is chairman of the board of uh, Kelso & Company, ESOP Investment Bankers. And he's also, if I may, the author of an extremely um, interesting and, if I may say, important book at this juncture in the development of the American Western world economies called Democracy and Economic Power, Extending the U.S. Uh, the ESOP Revolution. And um, welcome very, very much to Conversations, Lewis. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the program. Pleasure being here, Chair Harold. I, I did want to cite the fact that your book is here, and of course, going to talk to you about the book and about binary um, economics that you're the father of and so forth, and the importance of that. But we did want to start the program tonight in reference to another book that's on the um, best selling list as it happens now here in August of uh, 19. 87, and that being The Great Depression of 1990, written by Ravi Batra, that uh, you've read, we have, we've done an interview with Mr. Bat Dr. Batra recently. Uh, it's a dismaying prospect, but I wonder if maybe you could make comment, do you think that Dr. Batra is correct in his uh, assessment that the course the United States economy is following is going to lead not only to a recession, a depression, but a Great Depression in 1990? And his basic theme is one that is perhaps correct and certainly ought to be taken cognizance of? I do. I think he's right on, Harold. Mm -hmm. uh, he, um, he marshals his evidence uh, of um, a cyclical theory, and it makes sense. And the overwhelming evidence, the, the best summation of that evidence that I've seen is um, Dr. Batra's book. Uh -huh. It's very disturbing to think that we may In two problem. years, no in less. In only two years' time, yeah. at a time when, in many people's minds, the economy is doing very well. The Dow Jones Industrials well, are going that up. That was true, true in 1929 when it fell on its face before. Unfortunately, that was the case. And more and more people within the business world and so forth, outside, beyond the academic considerations and so forth in the business world, are of a mind that this kind of uh, prospect is in store for the United States. And well, I think there's a general feeling that it is. There is no sense of the timing. Mm -hmm. Dr. Batra marshals his evidence very well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think he's, uh, history, he's made a number of predictions based on similar evidence before, and, and they were turned out sound. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think he'll be accurate. He is accurate. He's got this notion of a 30-year and 60-year cycles for... Right. Uh, Basically, it's the generational cycle of yes. the active period of human lives. Um, and uh, Great Depressions, he maintains, usually occur when a serious recession is skipped for a generation. Mm. And, um, and the forces that bring about the uh, big collapse uh, are accumulated for two generations rather than one. Yes. One of the principal um, factors that he sees as creating a depression is the inordinate uh, concentration of ownership in the upper echelons of the society. I mean, a concentration of wealth and a Yes, he points to disparity. both the concentration of wealth and concentration of income. And you would agree with that as an oh, yes. underlying our, cause of what leads well, to speculative boom? We say depression? essentially the same thing in democracy and economic power. Uh -huh. uh, we don't say it in such alarming terms. We aren't alarmist. But on the other hand, I think it is probably time to be alarmed. Yes. Uh, two years to even begin conditioning the society for a a really total collapse that'll make the 29 depression look mild. Mm -hmm. uh, to do that in two years is a, is a formidable task. We, we refer to it simply as saying that in 1932, the New Deal being the new government brought in to cope with the uh, last uh, Great Depression, um, did start out with one sound point. I don't think that the New Deal economists in general even recognize what that point is. But the thing that they did was to implicitly, without doing it explicitly, 
recognize that government is responsible for prosperity of the economy. Mm -hmm. Now, our analysis of that is that, um, that uh, the human race has had a long enough history that we can look back and see what economic policy was laid down by nature before the age of industrialization, before the age of even tool making, mm -hmm. and how man was constructed by nature mm -hmm. to, to, to fit into that policy. And clearly, nature's economic plan was built around two fundamental ideas. One, the idea of private property, because the original economic power was labor power. Mm -hmm. And nature so locked the labor power into the body of each person that uh, the only way you could take it away from is kill him or s enslave him. Yes, right. And that was done, of course, yeah, but it was never became popular yeah. <laughs> with the customers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, and the other was the principle of um, economic democracy or autonomy. Uh -huh. That is to say, the allocation of power was one person, one labor power. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Different in quality, different in talents, but still, one person, one labor power. Uh -huh. Now, um, the thing that the New Deal did wrong is not recognizing that that was man's nature, uh, that man is fitted for <clears throat> an economy built on private property, not a collective idea of any kind, mm -hmm. but on private property, in economic power, and built upon autonomy, economic autonomy. That is the allocation of economic power person by person. Mm -hmm. uh, the New Deal picked the right highway, namely, while nature could allocate primitive economic power, only the state can assure the, the, um, the overall structure evolution of, of institutions which equip industrial man with economic power that is essentially external to himself, and that is capital, of course, meaning capital. land, mm -hmm. land structures, machines, capital intangibles normally represented in this economy by capital stock. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But instead of recognizing that, the New Deal said, aha, the state has got to be responsible. And it set out on a war on the effects of poverty, not the cause. In other words, it discovered the right road, but it set the whole society off in the wrong direction by 180 degrees. And it had to do with the fact that they were committed to this idea of distribution or relating by well, labor just was to an, the economy was, that was becoming increasingly technological. It involved the recognition that um, government is responsible for enabling people to equip themselves with economic power if it comes from, well, whatever it comes from. Yeah. Um, but it attacked the effects, not the cause. The cause would have necessarily been to, to uh, develop institutions which enable people born without capital to buy it, pay for it out of what the capital produces, not out of their labor earnings, because they're never adequate, never have been, never have and been. never will be. Uh -huh. Uh, except in the you know, case of a few geniuses. Mm -hmm. um, so that from 1932 to the present, we have been running on redistribution. That is, yeah. And when we say in our book um, that we're reaching the limits of redistribution, we're saying what uh, uh, Mr. Um, Batra says, uh, the Great Depression of 1990 is, on, is practically here. We're, we're reaching the limits of redistribution, and we're also suffering the effects of an overall structured, if I may, a structured economy wherein the access to capital to purchase stock that will pay for itself seems to be limited to only those who already have that kind of a well, happy that, that, relationship. Well, that's the error, and of course. The and the concentration of wealth is very, very much in evidence in our economy. Yeah, that's the error, and that's the myth that has to be rooted out. Uh -huh. 
uh, and we can't start soon enough, uh, rooted out to keep the society from turning into some total anarchy and, and, uh, and dissolving. Um, it's this concentration of wealth and the disparity between the lower segments of the society and the concentrated wealth in the upper yeah, escalation here, this, is the main problem. This, well, this diagram one, yes. uh, Harold, mm -hmm. uh, shows where the problem is. This is our conception of what has happened in the mixture of economic inputs mm -hmm. over the course of the 210 years, roughly, of the American society. At the beginning, in colo colonial days, 95% uh, of the input into production came from labor power. Mm -hmm. Thus, because that was nature's original source of economic power, and it was allocated one person, one labor power, you had the founding fathers introducing political democracy into a pre-existing economic democracy. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, it was a virtually a perfect, uh, yeah, the yeah. political democracy wasn't perfect, but, yeah. but nevertheless, it was as close to perfection, uh, and, it, and the political democracy became more perfected as time went on. It took till 1922 to get the voting power to women, for yeah, example. Right, but right, right. but um, in the meanwhile, it wasn't the underlying principles that changed. The Founding Fathers weren't aware that democracy requires not only the democratization of political power, but the democratization of economic power. Yes, yes. They assumed that the economic power would continue to be broadly diffused mm -hmm. because uh, it was believed, this is the mythology, this is the, this is the crooked myth that um, it may have been accidentally believed it, uh, in good faith for uh, a good many years, but eventually it became obvious that it was a lie and mm -hmm. it's still propagated as though it's a myth. And it represents national economic policy in the United States today. As it was, as it was formulated in 1946. Yeah, the Full Employment Act uh, is an economic policy that would be absolutely appropriate to a Stone Age. Uh -huh. You don't need uh -huh. capital to, to uh -huh. have that kind of a harebrained economic policy. Um, the principles didn't change, it was just that the facts changed. Of the means of production. The means of production. The Industrial Revolution, and this was, this is what um, um, Dr. Uh, Batra but, mm -hmm. does not see, but I'm sure when he gets around to our works he will see it. Um, the meaning of the Industrial Revolution is a change in the way that people do the world's work. Mm -hmm. From working exclusively through their labor power to working through their labor power and their capital. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Whereas at the beginning, you had economic democracy because labor power provided for 95% of the input. We estimate that today labor power provides at most for 10%. At most of the overall production of the economy by human input or labor is 10%, 90% being technology Come or from capital. Yeah. Capital. Capital. As land, a reality. Land, structures, machines, capital intangibles. As reality. Mm -hmm. As a fact. It's just mm -hmm. a fact. Now, would that be argued by people, that basic fact be argued by people? Or no, one's, be... no one has ever attacked it, uh -huh. except on, a, on an ideological ground, you mm -hmm, see? Mm -hmm. I mean, as long as you believe a myth, <laughs> why mm -hmm. argue about the facts? Mm -hmm. Don't confuse me with the facts, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they say. Because most people only have a labor relationship in order to have income to well, pay for well, life's necessities uh, yeah, and the, amenities. Look at diagram two. This, yes. this, really, uh -huh. this really tells you. Uh, yeah. What the what the real problem is? This is the same period uh, from colonial days to uh, to modern times to the year 2000, um, and it shows the ownership of labor power and the ownership of capital. Mm -hmm. Now remember, the first diagram showed that 
showed that the input mix was changing mm -hmm. from labor intensive to capital intensive. Well, what this diagram shows is that the ownership of capital doesn't change. There was a little bump up after the, after the uh, Homestead Acts, which was the deliberate policy of getting uh, capital into the hands of people who weren't born with it. Mm -hmm. uh, in a still agrarian age, yes, uh -huh. see, 1860s. Uh -huh. But uh, here you see that all the capital ownership has been pretty consistently in the top 5%. I'm talking about non-residential capital. Yes, all right. Uh -huh. uh, not that residences aren't an important, important form of capital. They're never enough. And we want to talk about it. Yes, right, right, eventually, uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. But it is this that is the uh, real force that is that brought about these uh, cycles that Dr. Uh, uh, Batra mm -hmm. uh, sees coming together in 1990 and and just blowing the lid off. Yeah, right. You have five percent of the people owning the capital that provides 90 percent of the input. And we've reached the limits of redistribution. The national debt is a two and a half trillion. Uh, it picked up a trillion in this administration alone. Yeah. Soon it'll pick up a trillion every year and, and accelerate after that. Uh, the trade deficit, which uh, arises out of the overpricing of labor, mm -hmm. uh, will get bigger and bigger. Uh, to hide the excess accumulated capital that people can't use, we refer to that in our book as morbid capital. That's the capital that can't possibly it's be the consumed capital, or spent by capital, the people at the top. Capital yeah. can't serve its purpose. You see, it's owned by a family that can only consume a tiny fraction of what they produce. Mm -hmm. And since they can't take it with them, yes. <laughs> what they're really doing is screwing up the economy by mm -hmm. holding it that way. If they could take it with them, everything would be uh, If they could pumped. take it with them, we would have serious problem. Mm -hmm. I've said that many times. Yeah because uh, each one of them would take it with him. That'd be his first choice. Uh -huh. And two generations, all the great industries would go bye-bye in the sky, and we'd be back to the Stone Age. Yeah, and uh, that, that uh, Mr. Robert Butler has some certain ideas what it, uh, as to how we might be able to address that problem. The problem being is that there is an inordinate concentration of ownership over the means of production at the uh, top one or top percent of the society. This is some of the reasons that have led to that. He has suggested certain ideas about how we could address that in the short term to either stave off or ameliorate the effects of this Great Depression. And I wonder, we have to take a little break now, but we could come back and address what you feel That's his true. ideas are in terms of how we might be able to address this to try to ameliorate the effects of this which so many of us uh, see upcoming. So we'll just Good come idea. back and take, address that if you don't mind. Please. Okay, so Across America, folks are finding that pooling pays. By making driving more fun. And putting fewer cars on the road. Your car can take a friend, or two, or even three. To work or play, or school, a pool is best for you and me. Even if you're going to public transit, it's better to go together. It saves effort. It saves fuel, and it sure saves money, too. Help yourself, help your country, share a ride with a friend. Yeah, back again now talking with Lewis Kelso, and we were talking about the concentration of ownership of the means of production in the United States economy is underlying the uh, the, the Great Depression that Ravi Batra sees uh, coming in 1990, and his solution has been, as he puts it out in the book, that there might be uh, a tax that we could place if we could get enough ground support for a large-scale tax upon the super-rich as a means of distributing through government and so forth. I wonder what do you think about his basic premise of, apart from the political difficulties, that what do you think of the idea that he has? I think the beauty and accuracy of his analysis of the business cycles mm -hmm. and the inevitability 
of the crash of 1990 is in sharp contrast with the absolute nonsense of that solution. Mm -hmm. And there's no way, believe me, there's no way that in the United States you're going to take the property away from the people who have it. It can't be done. They have the political power? They have the... Well, uh, it is, uh, it's mm -hmm. much uh, the problem that was identified by Machiavelli, yes. who I think was the first great tax lawyer myself. Mm. You remember he said to his client, who was the prince, he had a good one, uh, remember, sir, that uh, a man will forgive you for killing his father mm. before he'll forgive you for taking his capital estate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, human beings haven't changed <laughs> since Machiavelli's day, mm. and Yankees are much like Italians uh, mm. in their love of fathers, so you can see how much they hate having their property taken away. That's, a, that's, a, that's among the people at the top of the society, as it were, and in general... Well, it's, it goes much further than that, Harold. The general society uh, isn't aware of this problem. Since anyway. the problem is how to run the economic order mm -hmm. so that people who were born without capital can become efficiently equipped with it over a reasonable working lifetime, um, as they have not become as they have not been, as soon, soon. ninety five percent of the people don't own it any they don't own don't any own any non residential capital today mm -hmm. since that's the problem, an attack on the integrity of property is an attack on the future too and attacks upon the rich and the suggestion Mr. Butter would be seen constitutionally and so forth as well, an attack uh, upon the principle of property. Or, oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, and nothing else but. Uh -huh. I mean, yeah. and furthermore, they would run into our, uh, 15 constitutional buzz saws. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, yeah, the state, way. the Constitution says the state might not take property without due process. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, the Equal Protection of the Laws Clause, which underlies almost every other provision of the Constitution, uh, would be violated if you took the property of some to give it to, to if you yeah. took the property of the rich to give it to the poor. Well, we have been doing that through redistribution and through taxation. And We've care, that's through, what we say yeah. in our book. You yeah. see, we point out that we're reaching the limits of redistribution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We haven't, we, if we could have taken away enough from the rich to keep the poor living well, mm -hmm. which is ridiculous, can't yeah. be done, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have the national debt. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's how we got it. Yeah. Uh, we wouldn't have uh, unpayable foreign debts. So we've been warehousing excess wealth, morbid capital, in foreign countries that can never repay it. Morbid capital. Maybe you can morbid define capital, that. Morbid yes. capital is the capital that is... Morbid capital is capital that is so concentrated in a particular family that it ex that its income exceeds what that family will of its own volition use to support its consumption. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Remember now that the rich have their consumption limited by their morality, their sense of propriety, their uh, their um, uh, common sense. Mm -hmm. Only the poor have their consumption limited by their income. <laughs> yes. But that's 95% yes. of the people. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, that morbid capital uh, thus serves no symbiotic function at all. The purpose of capital is to enable people to produce more income, earn more income. Mm -hmm. The moment you earn more than you can use, will use voluntarily, you pick your own standard of living. Yeah. You can even make a damn fool out of yourself. Then it's not going to come back to. in consumption. Uh, yeah. Well, it yeah. can come back into consumption, but it could be ridiculous consumption. Yeah. And in some cases it is. Mm. But by and large, that excess capital is used to acquire more, right. which, which exacerbates the problem instead mm -hmm. of solves it. And leads to the kind of concentration of ownership yeah. now. Now, mm -hmm. this diagram three really shows you the problem. Uh -huh. And, and uh, Mr. Uh, Batra uh, makes a lot of Adam Smith. This diagram is built on the logic of Adam Smith, mm -hmm. um, who pointed out that the free market was a, is a very magical thing, the invisible hand, he called it, um, because it not only 
determines the value of what is produced by the economy, but it determines the income automatically arising out of production by the people who participate in production. Mm -hmm. And it equates the two so that the economy has to work, it has to uh, max optimize the production, optimize consumption. Everyone wants to live well. Mm -hmm. Everyone will have to produce the things that the market desires to live well. It's the most motivational economy you can conceive. The only problem was that Adam Smith was looking at the Industrial Revolution through the wrong end of the telescope. Yeah. And Mr. Say, who was a disciple of Smith, whose law we're talking about. Same, yeah. same problem. Right, huh? but, uh, but they can be forgiven. And the reason we can forgive them is that um, every economist since has made the same mistake, including, I'm sorry to say, mm. <laughs> Dr. Batra. Mm. <laughs> In other words, he does not realize that it is the change in the way that production is carried on from labor intensive to capital intensive and that that requires if you're going to carry out nature's economic plan and Adam Smith's ideas you've got to have techniques which equip as the result of the action of institutions guided by the state mm -hmm. uh, to equip people born without capital with it during their lifetime. And incidentally, it's imperative that that happen for other reasons. Um, the only way to earn income in a, in a market economy, a private property market economy, is to participate in production. Yes. Now, at some point, you either get tired or you get disabled and you can't participate in production. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that you should be cast out as in a state of nature and starved to death. No. It means that you need lifetime production based upon recognition that you enter the economy, if you do need to earn income, mm -hmm. as a labor worker. You pick up earning power year after year as a capital worker. You retire from the labor worker market at some point but go on till the day you die as a capital worker. Now, we have not done that historically in our economy. Only, we have not had only that. in those cases that use the tools that I've invented, mm -hmm. namely the Employee Stock Ownership Plan, or ESOP, and the other seven that are built on the same logic. Yeah. Those yeah. tools make it possible uh, to enable people to buy capital in the course of financing uh, the normal operations of business, including growth, mm -hmm. and to pay for it out of the yield of the capital itself. That's the logic of business that's, finance. That's the logic of business finance and it's the logic of binary economics, which recognizes that there are two ways to earn income, not just one, as all the national policies around the globe maintain. All the national policies and uh, views of economics from Marxian to, to some of the traditional capitalists to Keynesians are seeing labor as the major component or the component of production. We call them one-dimensional. They're one all one-dimensional. One -dimensional. Yeah. And until the ESOP, until the uh, binary economics uh, came along as it were relatively recently in the evolution of the United States and world economy, there hasn't been a system that began to systematically build ownership into the large mass well, of the people. Well, the, the system doesn't work that way even today. Yeah. In right. other words, we, we introduced the idea with a capitalist manifesto, which was co-authored by Mortimer Adler and myself mm -hmm. in 1958. Mm -hmm. And uh, this last book, Democracy and Economic Power, is the fourth mm -hmm. uh, book and rounds out the picture much more completely. But notwithstanding the fact that the idea has been public for 30 years now, yeah. uh, ESOPs, which are the most widely used of the tools, the others need, the other seven need legislative implementation. Mm -hmm. But the ESOP is widely used, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. But today, out of the half trillion dollars of capital transactions that are financed each year in the economy, less than 1% of 
are ESOP financed. Yeah, yeah. So that 99% of those transactions are propelling, accelerating the speed of the, of the approach of the disaster of 1990. Through the increased concentration. Through the increased concentration. And, yeah. and Dr. Batra sees that. He doesn't understand the underlying mechanism. And a great many people, uh, intellectual laymen and others, would not understand the reality of the need to have uh, the general citizenry relating to this capital uh, credit capability that is the, uh, underlies the business of logic, the logic of business finance. They wouldn't re recognize that in their day-to-day -day thinking about the economy. They're so concentrated on how they can get a job to keep themselves. Well, the, they, the they problem, don't see it the in problem is um, terms that perhaps uh, we might is, have to uh, is not. Uh, to ameliorate not the difficult room. to understand. Um, when we published the Capitalist Manifesto in 1958, we embarrassed every economy on earth, mm -hmm. not just those in the West Block and those in the East Block, but everyone everywhere else. The economy and the economists. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the reason was we pointed to an error in their factual assumptions. Now, you see, Writers and thinkers are very jealous about, about their ideas. And, um, and they believe devoutly in the First Amendment, which says uh, that any um, individual uh, is entitled to express his, his opinion on a matter of judgment. They misconstrue that, however, as a right to be wrong on the facts. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't. That is not covered by the First Amendment. You repeat an error, at least when you're in a position of public responsibility, like economists writing books mm -hmm. and making recommendations to governments and corporations and banks. Mm -hmm. You repeat an error of fact that under, undermines the economy and misleads the people. You're, a, you're simply a liar. Mm. Uh, there's, there's, there's no way to shield them from that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, they've never wa had the nerve or integrity or whatever to face up to that, to that, um, uh, Protecting uh, to admitting yeah. the factual error. Admitting it instead of there being only one way to earn income, to work, there are two. You can be a labor worker or you can be a capital worker, one who earns his income through his privately owned capital. Mm -hmm. And that at today's state of technology, uh, capital work provides most of the input. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the, the entire economy, and this is true around the world pretty much, looks to the economists for sound advice about economic matters. Mm -hmm. And what are they getting? They're getting nothing but lies on that point. Lies and misconceptions, lies, outright lies to protect her, or misconceptions, misunderstanding that could be what's the difference? amenable. Well, it could <laughs> be amenable. When you're talking about a fact, what do you, what's the difference? Yeah, I know. <laughs> it could be amenable maybe to, an under, uh, to understanding or, or, or to understanding of new policies that could be open to us, uh, that could be adopted without loss of face or something like that. I mean, There's no way to do it. I mean, mm -hmm. if the missing link is that 95% of the people don't own any non-residential capital, mm -hmm. and the solution is to enable that 95% reasonably and intelligently and orderly uh, operation of the genius of our institutions mm -hmm. to acquire it. And I think they can ac acquire enough of it to have a very steady economy mm -hmm. in a decade, mm -hmm. and they can totally solve the problem in two decades. Yeah, and as we, uh, if if taking the the, the 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 thoughts and myths and misconceptions and lies, if you will, from the past and so forth, as we approach a time of a potential disaster such as a depression, it really behooves us to be able to understand if there are alternatives to which could either alleviate or ameliorate the effects of that to the benefit of all. It's, it's really responsibility to it's try to It's terribly important, that. and frankly, uh, we, we should, within, within months, we don't have much time, we should, within months, change the national economic policy, which is the Employment Act of 1946. Okay, well, listen, we want to talk about that. We have to take another little break here if you could. We want to talk right. about that, uh, actual steps that we might be able to take to help in that direction. Uh, we'll come back in just a minute and let's do that. Okay. At last, 
session was nice and short? Yes, sir. We're a bit early for dinner. Uh-huh. This will give you and Alice more time to get acquainted. Uh-huh. Alice has really been looking forward to meeting you. Uh-huh. Honey! Ah! I think Alice needs a hug. Uh-huh. Who in the world needs your hug? Peace Corps is an individual experience. The success of Peace Corps lies in just the volunteer himself. And it's up to you to decide what you want to do and what you're looking for in your experience. For me, it's broadened my scope of seeing things. So I recommend it to anybody. It may not be the easiest two years of your life, but it could be the most rewarding. Call toll-free 800-424-8580. Peace Corps, the toughest job you'll ever love. Back again with Lewis Kelson. We were saying at the break that there was the Employment Act of 1946 as a basic grounding policy it's statement. It's the economic maybe, policy. Maybe share a little bit of that for the general audience, where that fits in, and then see what we might be able to um, suggest yes. as policy for the future. To the Employment Act was adopted as national economic policy, very belatedly. Mm. But all that did is formalize what had been the factual economic policy since 1776. Mm. Namely, that um, to legitimately earn income, you got to work. Yeah. Um, what is needed, and we outline this in our book, is to change that, and I think uh, 11 words will do it, mm -hmm. to recognize that um, full employment uh, can only be achieved intelligently in the light of there being two ways to engage in production. Uh, you need to be fully employed in the sense of earning enough income to live well. Mm -hmm. This economy can afford to enable everyone to live well. And that means heavy dependence, or increasingly heavy dependence, on capital earned income. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you can do that with 11 words. And it simply means that full employment means that everyone's fully employed as a labor worker or capital worker, ideally as both. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it, gives the, it would give the same sanctity to earning income through your privately owned capital as through your privately owned labor power. Yeah, it might even reduce the amount of property that would have to be necessary to gain income if you could get rid of some of the dist redistributive taxation that no has question been about eroding it. the power it's of private property. No, you're, you put your finger right on it. The typical stockholder today gets about 10% of the income uh, that the assets representing, represented by his stock earn. Mm -hmm. um, that means that capital is eight, nine, 10 times as powerful as it appears to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In other words, the income in terms of purchasing power that you might get from a capital estate of a half million dollars mm -hmm. today you would get from a capital estate of 50,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it weren't for all that redistribution that takes place, you've got state corporate income taxes, federal corporate income taxes, uh, social security, mm -hmm. both employee and employer, but it all comes out of the employer because that's where the money comes from. Mm -hmm. And finally, the corporation to finance its growth, but to finance its growth in the wrong way, namely to make the rich richer, mm -hmm. uh, takes out whatever else it wants to do that. Yeah, and the, the amount of uh, a business investment normally will pay for itself in four to five years as a yes. rule of thumb. So the return that is being expected by the people responsible for that is considerably higher. You could lock the general citizen into the earning power that is behind Directly the of the assets line. represented by corporate stock. Uh -huh. And that would be a secret of, in a certain sense, opening up increased capital formation overall oh, available heavens, yes. to the economy. No, there, there, are no, there are no known limits in fabricated capital. Only physical limits we'd begin to run into rather than the institutional you'd, limits. It'd be a long time before you run into any physical limits. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I mean, there's a time problem of how fast you can build railroads and yeah. build factories and so forth. But aside from that time problem and you can eliminate most of that. With well-financed, ec ec ecologically sound addendum that could allow them to be ecologically sound also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the, the limit on 
the limits on the economy today are uh, institutional yeah. and artificial. Mm -hmm. It's that we build incremental capital earning power into people who have surfeited needs and wants, and we deny incremental earning power to the masses who, who, who either live lousy lives or far below the standard that they would like. Increasingly, people, are homeless people, there's a sort of thing that have yeah, no... Yeah, take a look at the housing problem. Yeah. Um, there are at least 25 million people in the United States who would like to have homes. Absolutely. And there isn't a chance they'll ever get, get them. Increase. I mean, there are ma that many that can't, just can't make it. But there are none, another 50 or 60 million that live in ticky-tacky boxes uh -huh. who would like to have good adequate copious right. homes. All of which is available to us overall collectively. There are no known prepared. limits in right. the house building industry and the yeah. people who are in it, involved in it, in every aspect of it, would love to produce yeah. more. Uh -huh. Five times more, ten times more, a hundred times more. So the growth of the economy what, what could many times more. What? The customers don't have the purchasing power. Right. Why don't they? Because of this stupid one dimension ideology mm -hmm. that is really what Dr. Batra is attacking, but he mm -hmm. hasn't identified it yet. Yes, yeah, right, right. I hope he will. Uh huh. And the only thing, uh, and the now the ESOP, the Employee Stock Ownership Plan, has been a method that has begun to open up that capital credit available to yes, employees there, within corporations. There are hundreds and, and that's hundreds. A start, relatively small, but a start in that direction. It's a start, and it's been yeah. proven to yeah. be practical. Proven I mean, over it, the last decade. It works or so. like yeah. gangbusters. Good bipartisan support um, for the concept. There, the there are many. Um, imitators, yeah. Uh, yeah. counterfeits, yeah. Uh, and uh, again, you have to blame the economists mostly. Binary economics has been in the public domain for 30 years. Mm -hmm. It is not taught in one right. economics right. class, right. political science class, mm -hmm. philosophy class, business school, law school, mm -hmm. professional school operated by the, the lawyers, the bankers, the uh, economists, the the uh, uh, accountants. Yeah, right. uh, it's it's as though uh, it's Galileo all over. It's, right? Yeah, it's Galileo so. over. It's no. Pasteur all yeah, over. Yeah. It's as though we uh, refuse to believe germ theory, which we did for 20 years or so. And yet, you've been able to get with Russell Long, Senator Long became idea. Uh, it get bipartisan support with the We've had 20 pieces of legislation, of legislation that have encouraged, it. Right. encouraged ESOP. Right. And the idea is, right. be, is there. It's firm, yes, it's it an idea, and it is yeah. an idea that could begin to move in a way counter to the way historically it would have gone if we hadn't. That's exactly right. But it can go in another but, dimension. But, but so. there are all kinds of sad aspects to that. The Department of Labor should be taking leadership in raising the earning power of workers. Yeah, true, yeah. Now, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. You can't do it by making them work harder. That mm -hmm. went out of style a hell of a long while ago. Yeah, right. And furthermore, they know it's not necessary. But they have a psychological commitment to this idea of productivity and labor's earning power. And they got psychological it. commitment to all kinds of myths that keep a bunch of people with vested interests in the errors of the system and unfortunately employed. Some, yes sir and, and, and unfortunately so many people in the general society have those myths imbued in their consciousness that's true. and I it's mean, a conscious wall street pretty much is uh, or <coughs> runs a gambling casino uh -huh. has very little to do with the financing of growth uh -huh. very little to do uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, most corporate growth is financed internally. Uh -huh. Never goes near Wall Street. Now we have the ESOP. That's an example that can begin to lead us, as it were, out of this uh, path of the Red Sea or whatever this this, this way. It's it's an, an approach. Now there are other financing techniques that use the logic of the ESOP, and maybe yeah, you precisely. could talk we, about. We we need those, uh, Harold, for the very simple reason that there are a lot of people out there who are citizens, mm -hmm. who are protected by the Constitution, yes. and who are entitled to the benefits of the Declaration of Independence, and are entitled to a sound economy, who don't work for big corporations, yes, right. big prosperous corporations. Yes. Uh, now those other seven tools uh, would um, make it possible to build the ownership by buying and selling again, but selling by enabling the new stockholders to pay for what they have bought out of the earnings of out what they of bought. Out of the earnings. Yeah. So it doesn't have to come out of savings. We could, in that way, democratize the ownership of uh, structures of all kinds, 
apartment houses, hotel buildings, um, structures of all kinds. Uh, with the public capital ownership plan or PubCop financing, we could um, privatize publicly used capital, build the ownership into economically underpowered constituents. That could be identified by... And the, yeah. pub, and the privately owned companies would lease those facilities to the public user as the streets and highways might be leased to cities and the, and the, uh, the subway uh, might be leased to cities. And th those people could be identified through a political process on the basis of... Would have to be. Um, Congress some would have the a job of... Some underclass people? Some underclass people could well, be, it would, be involved? Well, they would have home. to be economically underpowered. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, in other words, mm -hmm. once you understand economics as a powerful uh, binary planning, planning tool, you realize that government must uh, police this morbid capital problem. Incidentally, the common law obliges it to do that. Yes. Mm -hmm. See, the common law in defining private property, defines it as um, a bundle of rights, which an owner may own in the thing that he owns, but always subject to two limitations. He may not use his property to injure the person or property of another. He may not use his property to injure the public welfare. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, the minute you recognize that capital ownership is an active thing, mm -hmm. a way to participate in production and earn income, then you're right up against those limitations. Mm -hmm. Individual owners may not own so much of it or be permitted to own so much of it that they won't consume what they produce and thus deprive, since the whole system is built on double entry bookkeeping, mm -hmm. will deprive others of the opportunity to earn decent incomes at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now. That's an, there's no new law. It's just understanding the laws that have been on the books for a couple of hundred years. Now the ESOP is uh, up a couple and, thousand years. Yeah, uh, up, uh, ESOP is up and going, running. It's going on its own now. In order to be able to realize these other uh, seven financing techniques, including residential, Congress needs to. Uh, there is the clear, act clear of the legislative Congress way, so yeah. that there would be the need for political leadership, and then perhaps also that's right constituency support for political leadership Both. for specific. Both. And there should be business leadership. No, business. B no business is going to win anything by having a, a fascist government step uh, yeah. in. Because this is where it could lead uh, Because to this is where uh, the uh, Great Depression of 1990 would, would lead us uh -huh. if we didn't have an answer. Uh -huh. We uh -huh. have an answer. The uh -huh. answer lies in recognizing the facts right under our nose. Yeah. Capital is an important producer of goods and services, and everybody needs to own some. In order and to get it legitimately, in order to realize particularly these others and to uh, to 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 facilitate further the developments of the ESOP, there would be the possibility of recognizing uh, capital credit available. There would be an act of Congress. There would be an activity on the part of Congress that could be done in order to usher in these capabilities. Or yes. What specifically would people in the government need to do, and could the citizens begin to start think about encouraging their uh, their congressmen or their governmental leaders, as it were? to uh, pursue? Well, the, uh, we outline in our book uh, the eight tools all together, yes. as well as the presently well-known ESOP. I won't say widely used. It needs to finance 100% of all transactions instead of 1% out, uh, out of a half trillion a year. Mm -hmm. uh, but the um, change in economic policy from reliance upon savings-based financing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the evil of which, mm -hmm. the evil of which, lies in the fact that five percent of the people own all the savings. Mm -hmm. You finance by resort to savings, and you just make the rich richer. That's, mm -hmm. that's exactly where we went wrong. To commercially insured capital credit insurance, we outline that uh, it involves no new institutions. It involves recognizing articulately what the New Deal recognized inarticulately back in 1932. Government is responsible for the prosperity of the economy. Mm -hmm. But um, commercially insured capital credit financing, as our diagram uh, in the book um, illustrates, mm -hmm. um, would, um, this is the diagram. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, would uh, make capital credit on 
self-liquidating financing mm -hmm. and any sound capital financing has to be scrutinized from the question of its ability to liquidate itself yeah, and, and they all do that's, yeah. a, that's a, the logic of it always has been true sure um, thus we would shift from a policy of uh, government solving its responsibility by coerced trickle down mm -hmm. which makes everybody madder than hell and forces at least two-thirds of the economy to live below the standard of living that they should live yeah. Uh, to one that runs smoothly and can be regulated. And, and uh, thus, and Dr. Batra recognizes this in his wonderful little book, uh, the cyclical events are not inevitable. They're only inevitable as long as you don't understand what causes them. Binary economics explains what the cause of the Great Depression is. Mm -hmm. And the sooner we get a hold of those handlebars mm -hmm. and start driving, the sooner we'll be able to, we can't avoid that cataclysm, but we can condition the society to understand that we can steer out of it, we can overcome it, and hold out hope. And um, the, the, the crash is by no means as serious as some people would imagine. Uh, the fact that third world countries won't pay their debts, mm -hmm. well, that has adverse effects. But in general, it won't make that much difference. Because the, pe and, the and the fact that the national debt may not be repaid mm -hmm. uh, doesn't make that much difference. Because those credits came from people's morbid capital. Mm -hmm. That's capital they wouldn't use. That's capital that in the practical sense they won't miss. Mm -hmm. That's capital which if it were repaid to them, they wouldn't know what the hell to do with it. The more important thing would be to restructure our economy so, so that we works. can realize the full potential so it that works it has prospectively into the future. and dynamically, right. And um, you, you are, you are um, optimistic in a certain sense that we're going to be able to achieve that? Well, it's doable. Now, it is doable. Now, right? whether, uh, whether we're going to wake up soon enough or not, it's a, it's a, that's a question to wait two years and find out. It is doable, and uh, it, it, it is doable, and the institutions are there and in place. And They're all there, and the, they all would gain. I wonder if we could. We're coming up to a presidential election period now in our in our uh, in it our national It ought to be involved in the presidential election. It should be it involved. It ought to be involved. In fact, there's nothing else really uh, uh, that is one hundredth as important. Uh -huh. as facing that question and preparing to solve it. And preparing to solve that and have candidates. And I wonder whether or not the public consciousness of this shift, this is a monumental shift in terms of the way the society would be organized and the understanding of it. Yes um, and no, but th there isn't anyone who doesn't understand how important capital is to the economy. Uh -huh, uh -huh. There isn't one, anyone who wouldn't like to own it. The American dream, they, but the American dream has option. always been to own a piece of the action. Yes. Uh -huh. It's just that for at least a half a century now, since 1932, uh, it's been thought to be impossible. Well, it is not impossible. I mean, ESOPs are making people rich. Well, uh -huh. uh, where, where they work in ESOP companies, ESOP financed companies, uh, for 10 or 15 years before they have to retire, they retire rich. They mm -hmm. retire as capital workers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, uh, well, it, it happens to be infinitely easier than trying to continue this myth that you can solve the income distribution problem through jobs as they increasingly become less adequate. They become less adequate, so it opens up perhaps alternate st styles of living, as it were, that people can see. Oh, Increased leisure, perhaps, opportunities, leisure, cultural capabilities. Education. Uh, almost renaissance capabilities that could be there for absolutely, a absolutely, absolutely, affluently leisured way of life, yes. which You're in and of itself is a transition from the way most people think now who are in that labor pool scrambling just to keep their nose above water. Yeah, with two jobs and neglecting their children and yeah. raising hell with family life. Um, you remember Aristotle justified slavery. Now for one of the wisest men who ever lived to believe in slavery sounds like a pretty serious thing, a pretty serious flaw in his character. Mm. Well, he explained it quite carefully. He said, after all, what is man's reason for being on earth? Mm -hmm. It's to understand why he's here. Yeah. 
yeah. and to, to acquire culture and knowledge. And if he has to work from sun up to sundown, he can't do that. Toiling. So you have to have slaves, mm -hmm. he said. But he protected himself. He said, however, if the shuttle would weave by itself, if the plectrum mm. would play by itself, mm -hmm. Remember, one of the duties of slaves was to play yeah. music to ennoble the mind yeah, of the yeah, philosopher yeah. kings. Uh, we would have to think this whole thing through again. Mm -hmm. Well, there's damn little sh cloth that isn't woven today by automatic shuttles. Yeah. Uh, and there's very little music <laughs> that isn't played by hi-fis or records or reproduced. And there's very little goods and services produced altogether that aren't produced by capital. That's right. Now, what do we have instead of what Aristotle vis visualized, the sir. leisure society, 60% yeah. huh? of the wives are working. I know. And I even know. wives with little children. Yeah, I know. Men are holding two jobs. Yeah, I know. I and know. we're and we're we're living like stupid dogs for the most part. The yeah. top 5% live well, maybe 10%. So if we could see our way through, we might be able to open up to what would be almost I don't want to use terms overly overly uh, as we approach a very crucial moment in the evolution of human affairs, atomic weaponry hangs over our head and so forth, but we have the means by which we can open up a liberated society for That's allowing right. all That's of right. the fruits of civilization to be able to be at the... And we could stop focusing on building weapons that are obsolete. War is obsolete. Absolutely. We can't admit that because to maintain this myth of full employment We've got to keep uh, everybody working, whether what they produce is useful or not. Well, you've, you've, you've shown us a way out of this, Lewis Carlson. For that, I want to thank you for all your work over the years. I certainly want to thank you for uh, participating pleasure, here in Conversations Against. Great pleasure, as always, to see you. Interesting to be able to put your work against that of Mr. Botras, which is popularly in the consciousness of the society now. And again, really, thank you really very, very much. Thanks. We could go on talking for hours, but uh, we've laid out the groundwork, and thanks again very much. It's been your pleasure to have the perceptions of Lewis Kelso, then. Um, uh, the uh, chairman of Kelso and Company and the author of this extremely interesting book, uh, Democracy and Economic Power. Happy to have been able to bring you those perceptions. We in Conversations invite you to tune in again next week. We'll be coming back next week. That's it for this segment. We're coming back next week. Lewis, once again, thank you very much. Good night. See you next week.